Welcome to the Renaissance Woodworker Shop Update for January 6th, 2017. I'm Shannon Rogers. Happy New Year! And here's what's been happening in my shop this week. Well, I finished up a lot of Christmas gifts. You guys may remember from a few weeks ago, I was turning a bunch of ice cream scoops. Well, I ended up making 12 of those, all told, which uh, it turned out to be kind of a lot of fun because I got into a real rhythm and started playing around with the handles and kind of shaping each one slightly differently and had just a lot of fun just turning. Helps to burn a couple calories on the lathe too. I uh, built a couple of pens. Uh, one in particular had a, a calligraphy tip to it for a relative of mine that does a lot of calligraphy. And uh, that was always fun to turn one of those nice high-end kits. It's a Majestic Junior kit. I turned about, I wanna say 10 or 15 pens, it's closer to 15 I believe which uh, is always fun because that becomes kind of a mass production line as they start drilling out all the blanks all at once and gluing in all the brass tubes at once and turning everything all at once. Used mostly CA finish on that, but I also got a chance to try out the Aussie oil stuff. It's made by U-Butte Finishes. If you've watched me turn it all over the last eight years or so, you see I use a lot of Triple E cream and Shellow Wax cream, all made by the U-Butte company down in Australia. Well, I don't know how long ago they came out with Aussie oil, but it was just really brought to my attention in the last couple of months. And I picked up a little bottle of it. And I gotta say, it's impressive. It creates the same shine and same kind of high build look of the CA finish in like seconds. So as far as long-term durability, I don't know yet because it's just the first time I've used it, but um, I'm really impressed with it. So if you haven't tried out uh, Aussie oil yet, uh, I got mine at Penn State Industries. I think you can find it at uh, Craft Supplies or, or woodturnerscatalog.com as well. So it might be worth checking out. The last thing I did was for my mother-in-law, um, who's a pretty avid gardener, I turned some gardening tools. And if you've been paying attention, you saw I made this for my own mom about four years ago, something like that. So I had that other kit floating around. I've mentioned this before, I often buy extra kits. I had that second kit floating around and we were trying to find just something from my mother-in-law and out of the blue, I was like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> so I made some gardening tools out of some cool figured sapili. Actually, it was an offcut leftover from my flywheel lathe that I built. So uh, it's very meta to be turning parts used for the flywheel lathe on a lathe, so yeah. Anyway, once I finished all that turning, I just needed a break, honestly, and most of my Christmas and New Year's holiday was spent <laughs> making Legos. <laughs> Specifically, a almost 5,000 piece uh, Ghostbusters headquarters uh, Lego kit that I'm only about maybe halfway through right now. So yeah, that's kind of what I spent most of my time. But there was kind of a cool surprise that landed on my bench. Well, I say cool, but it's also a little bit bittersweet. My um, brother's wife, my sister-in-law, uh, she lost her father this past year, this past fall. And he was an avid woodworker, kind of a semi-professional woodworker. Once he retired, he really went hardcore with it. And um, when he passed, he left a shop full of tools. And my brother gathered up some of his hand tools and sent them to me. And I kind of knew it was coming, but I didn't know what was coming. So I opened this box and um, just this gorgeous router plane from about 1885 was in there. This uh, Stanley number three, number three C actually with a corrugated sole and these old Stanley yellow handled chisels. And if you guys aren't familiar with these chisels, they are awesome. They kind of get looked down upon because they've got the you know plastic yellow handle. Well, that's not a good chisel, but you know, when these were out, this, this yellow handle, this composite handle was all the rage. It was the atomic age. We wanted, we didn't want to use wooden handles because that was old fashioned, but the steel on these and just the, their, their butt chisels, they're really short. They're just fantastic. So I was shocked and just so excited to have an entire set of these, but moreover, they were maintained beautifully. Now, uh, this gentleman, uh, he got sick very quickly, but he hadn't been in a shop in some time. But what was really amazing to see is how well maintained these tools. Look at the sole of that router plane. These tools have been kept razor sharp. They've been oiled. They've been maintained against rust. All of these chisels were literally razor sharp right out of this roll. I took them out of the box and was using them. I was pulling up wispy thin shavings with his number three, like two minutes after I took them out of the box. So it's an incredible honor to be handed another craftsman's tools in incredible condition, incredible shape, 
and be asked to essentially carry on the tradition. So, you know, if this has ever happened to any of you guys, cherish that moment and, and, and be humble about it because it's just an amazing thing. You think about how protective we are of our own tools and knowing that someday we'll pass and somebody's gonna end up with our tools and you're gonna go, oh, I don't know about that. But knowing that they're gonna be cared for, like I will definitely care for these tools, um, I hope that makes him happy. And um, I am incredibly honored to be able to continue to use these tools. It was just kind of a fun little story and um, you're certainly gonna see these popping up in projects uh, in the future. And speaking of projects, I wasn't sitting on my butt doing Legos the entire time. I did finish this square. Uh, in the Hand Tool School, we have a, a group called Apprenticeship. It's essentially the, the membership side of things with a little bit of kind of one-on-one -on -one coaching, but also additional content and stuff. And we do these things called apprentice challenges. And they're just really simple, straightforward projects that really focus on specific skills. They don't take a lot of time to build. It's not a huge investment in stock, but it really gets you focusing on certain skills. And this was complex joinery. And this square is held together with a through wedge tenon and a sliding dovetail, and then an inlaid peg runs entirely through the square that kind of interlocks it together. And I've been calling it my Japanese joinery square, even though I haven't really seen this joint in any of my Japanese joinery books, but it's kind of derived from several joints that I did see that worked for like scarf joints and things like that. And I adapted it to be this right angle joint. So I use Peruvian walnut for the blade. I use teak for the handle and some Amboinia burls, a little pop of color on here. And it was a fantastic project, a really rewarding project to get to not only focus on milling, doing a little bit of curve cutting and doing a lot of complex joinery work, I ended up with a highly functional um, and, and very accurate square. There's a whole other part on actually squaring it up and learning how to square it up. So it's the, the moral of the story here is not so much to pitch apprenticeships, but the handle school. But if, if it worked, hey, that's great. But more importantly is just taking some time to build a simple small project, something that you can use in your shop can just reap huge rewards when it comes to your skill. In fact, I'm gonna put it to use right now. I got a question from Caleb this week about sawing plum. He watched my video on um, one step to better sawing. That video I talked about where taking that step back will help you improve your accuracy as you saw square across the board. He's still having trouble getting that cut vertical, getting it perfectly plumb. So I wanted to talk a few tips, talk about a few tips in order to keep that saw cut plumb. So the first thing to making a square cut is marking it out as square. So I'll not only mark a line across the face, but then I'll go ahead and mark a line down the thickness. And I mark it down the face that's nearest to me. So I could mark it back here. There's nothing wrong with that, but I can't see that line as I'm standing back and sawing. So it's important to mark it down the face that you can actually see. Now, the whole take a step back thing still applies here. You certainly want to continue to saw across, square across this face. And now it becomes about breaking the cut up into two separate cuts. Instead of trying to track a square across the face and plumb at the same time, just start by taking a shallow kerf across the face. Taking that step back really helps that. Another thing that helps is to use the full saw plate. If you just take short straw, saw strokes, you're not really using the straightness of the saw plate to your advantage. So you often see me when I go to make a cut, I really kind of commit to it and I'll take a full length cut and that really will end up giving you a straighter cut. So now that that's established that kerf across the surface, I'm actually gonna even take a further step back. So now I can lean my handle down and work down my line. and I can actually steer the saw one way or another working down that vertical line. Now what I've created here is a triangle. My line runs down to this point, it runs all the way to my other face, and then there's a slope in between. If I now utilize that slope, the saw plate is held on this line, square across the face, and it's also held in the kerf down the edge, so it's established on a nice plumb line. So I can, 
keep that saw angled down like that and finish my cut. And if I check it with a square, I am nice and plumb and nice and square across the face. So that's one way. And it works really well on thicker boards where you've got a lot more real estate to cover down that face. Just doing it in two parts, across the face and down the edge. Or if you want, down the edge and then across the face. But you're using the combination of the geometric planes created with those starter curves to hold the whole thing in check. You've got essentially two planes holding that saw in check. Now, the really old school method, and I've done a video on this before, is to examine the reflection of the saw plate itself. As I set the saw on the board, I can look at this reflection, the reflection of the board in it, and as I go from side to side, you see how the lines of that reflected board change. When I've created a straight line between the reflection and reality, I know that I'm square. But if I'm angled one way or another, it also changes that line. So not only does that straight line indicate that I'm square, it indicates that I'm plumb. So I can step back and look at the reflection on my saw plate. And making that starter cut, I can see that I'm square and also I'm a little bit tilted to the left just because the line is angled down. So I'll tilt it up a little bit so that it's aligned. Drop my handle down watching that reflection the whole time. And now, let's see how we did. I'm square across the face, and I am vertical. Nice plumb cut. And you'll notice there was no layout line there. I did not use a layout line at all. I used the reflection of the saw to guide that cut. But still, you saw that it was still treated as a two-part cut. I lined everything up in the reflection and I took that shallow cut and then I started to drop my handle down while still paying attention to the reflection. So treat it as a two part cut, watch that reflection, lay out your lines. All of that together should give you a nice plumb cut. Caleb, I hope that helps you out and allows you to take one step closer to sawing Nirvana. And always, if you guys have any questions about hand tool, woodworking, hand tools, whatever, send them to me. You can contact me via my website. Caleb contacted me via Facebook on the Renaissance Woodworker page. It's pretty easy to get in touch with me. YouTube comments, Instagram, whatever, I'm around. Let me know what questions you have, and I may answer them here on the update. We'll see you next week, folks.